Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself for the stories making news and moving markets in the APAC region. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business app. Joining us now in our studios right here in Hong Kong is Ekaterina Bigosh, who is CIO of Core Investment Asia X Japan at AXA Investment Managers. Ekaterina, thanks very much for coming in. So I had this little tidbit here from, uh, from Mingbao newspaper this morning that the number of transactions for the 10 biggest residential estates in Hong Kong jumped over the weekend, up some 87.5% from uh, uh, a, a week ago to the highest level since the latter part of March. The reason I bring this up is because it kind of raises this notion as to whether or not what the Fed is about ready to do is fully priced into markets. Everybody knows they're going to cut, or at least that's the presumption. Uh, so I'm wondering whether or not it is priced in, or when you see a story like this, you say, well, maybe not. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, probably priced in, and uh, I would say it's priced in more than the current environment uh, is showing us. I'd say probably the indications uh, or the probabilities of cuts or the magnitude of cuts uh, around 200 basis points over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, which I would say is more indicative of a recessionary environment rather than the current uh, market environment. Uh, and as we've heard earlier, you know, the resilience in the U.S. economy is still present uh, in terms of overall consumption. The investment is uh, uh, still recovering, uh, slowly but recovering. Uh, and then if you look at Atlanta GDP, um, uh, now GDP is uh, the probability or the estimates for um, uh, U.S. growth for next quarter is around 2.5. So I would say broadly, U.S. economy is staying more resilient. It's not indicating a recessionary environment. And certainly the uh, cuts that are priced in at the moment are more conducive or uh, are indicating of, of, of that uh, recessionary environment. So I'd say it's probably more priced in than uh, uh, than the current environment indicates. Can we talk about China next? We had this disappointing data dump over the weekend, uh, retail sales, uh, factory output, fixed asset investment. We've got a spike in the jobless rate to a six month high, uh, home prices falling from the previous month. What is the government to do in a situation like this? It's a complex situation and we've talked extensively about in the previous sessions. You know, obviously the, the challenge for uh, Chinese economy at the moment is that the cons consumer sentiment is subdued and the investment sentiment is subdued. Uh, it's a private investment and foreign investment also uh, has been one of the historical lows uh, for China. Uh, certainly the uh, market has been calling for a more stimulus, whatever that's monetary or fiscal, uh, but it's not a straightforward exercise. Uh, when you look at uh, monetary stimulus, obviously there are restrictions around how far can uh, uh, the PBOC go to cut rates, again, considering these, the, the bank's uh, net interest margins, and they need to protect that to protect the financial stability. Uh, and also, they've been restricted in the past by the Fed monetary policy. And now with the Fed moving uh, in, uh, in, in this week's meeting, uh, we certainly see a little bit more room for them uh, to adjust that monetary policy. When it comes to fiscal as well, that's lagged for this year. And I think one of the challenges that we observed is that as much as they have room to do more with regards to fiscal uh, policy, there's less projects that they see deemed uh, to be uh, providing a return for the investment. So I think uh, the projects that uh, they deployed in the past has been infrastructure, uh, and those are just less to come by. So uh, I think it's not a straightforward exercise as where they could adjust. I think the one part that uh, the market has been calling off is more to be done with regards to the property market. As we all know, that is uh, closely attached to consumer sentiment and to the wealth effect in China. Uh, and Certainly more measures in that space uh, would be obviously very welcome by the market. Hong Kong is an interesting market because it, it's, it's very much interest rate dependent. So uh, it really is watching the Fed very closely and will move and groove a lot by what the Fed does. However, it's also very exposed to China. Uh, so in, in some ways, we might bear the brunt today when we get trading. we got the futures down a little bit here. We may um, take some of the brunt of the weaker economy in China. But then there is that positivity. And particularly if you say that uh, the, the U.S. economy looks like it's well positioned to be able to handle um, rate cuts here and, uh, and, and to benefit because of that. 
Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think the, the trajectory for here, it's positive, but I think we need to look at uh, various uh, elements of it. Uh, the volatility is expected across the board in all markets. As I said earlier, the market is pricing in a lot more cuts than the current environment or the data indicates. Uh, so volatility, if the Fed, of course, moves, uh, or, or no, it will move uh, uh, on this meeting, but I think that the market is still undivided, whatever is a 50 or 25. Uh, our view that it's going to be at 25 with somewhat a dovish tilt and indications that they're ready to move move more aggressively than they need to. And I think that's positive. One other part that you have to consider with regards to markets is that coming into this meeting, uh, the markets have rallied quite a lot. Again, a, a narrow rally, uh, but we had a lot of uh, uh, market performance across the board, particularly in the US. Uh, and certainly uh, any elements of uh, hawkishness or any signs that the Fed will have to pare back uh, some of those uh, expectations or the, the market will have to pare back some of those expectations of cuts uh, will certainly bring additional volatility to, to the markets. But if there is the perception that financial conditions overall may be a little too easy for the Fed's comfort, I mean, to be somewhat hawkish or at least conservative may not be a bad step, right? That's right. And, and you, you rightly said so. When you look at the Fed, it's not uh, the, the financial conditions are the driver of growth. So I think that's what we need to pay attention to. Uh, and that is, is, is driven by the Fed decision, but also other elements like of equity markets, credit spreads. And as I said earlier, the market has been quite uh, constructive uh, and I would say bullish this year uh, and the financial conditions have eased. So we are in a situation where we're coming to a Fed cut, uh, but the financial conditions are, are easy. They are, they are easy. So, uh, they're not as restrictive. So, uh, again, seeing a Fed cutting with 50 basis points when the data is still resilient, the, that 50 basis point is not in the data and we have financial conditions uh, that are somewhat uh, less restrictive. Uh, again, it's going to be certainly uh, so it's less likely. It's interesting because what you're saying and what you're describing uh, might not be so good for markets going forward, but it could be very good for the economy. If you say the economy doesn't need, you know, 25 or 50 basis points or the positioning of the Fed and, and that the Fed may deliver to a certain extent. That, that could be good. Uh, and I, I agree with that. Look, I think uh, a normalization, uh, worldly normalization of the Fed, of the monetary policy, I think is more constructive for the market. As much as market, we want a 50 basis points cut, and they positively have priced that. Uh, in a normal circumstances, a cut of uh, 50 basis points will indicate that U.S. Uh, or the Fed is worried about the economy, and they have to cut a lot quicker. Uh, a 25 is more uh, normal pace of normalization of that monetary policy, which we do think is constructive. Uh, for risk assets, constructive for uh, a broader economy, and certainly for places like credit uh, and uh, parts of, of equity market as well. So what parts of the equity market uh, appear attractive to you? If you had to put capital to work in the APAC region, ex-Japan right now, how would you go about doing that? I think we've been very constructive, I think, from the beginning of the year. Instead of looking at uh, markets specifically, is looking at themes that are supported uh, by various drivers in the economy. Uh, and we've been constructive on tech, we've been constructive on decarbonization, longevity. Uh, and I'll break down on that a little bit. When you look at tech, uh, that had ramifications uh, uh, or positive performance in equity markets in the US, but also Korea. If you look at Korea and Taiwan, that, that those have benefited uh, quite significantly on that tech drive and certainly particularly the semiconductor and the exposure of those two countries uh, to sec semiconductor uh, uh, sector. When we look into the next stage, and I think this is, I would say, next stage, we're talking about Fed uh, normalizing monetary policy and then giving a clear guidance of the next steps and the ability for the Fed to continue with that policy adjustment. Uh, we see the broader market uh, recovering uh, from, from there onwards. We need to see leverage coming back in the economy. And as I said earlier about the restrictiveness in Hong Kong, particularly on that leverage. So leverage have to come back in the smaller companies. Uh, businesses have to be able to start uh, borrowing again and deploying mm -hmm. back into the the economy to see the broader market perform. All right, Ekaterina, thanks very much for joining us. Ekaterina Bigosh, who is a CIO of Core Investment Asia X Japan for AXA Investment Managers. Former President Trump now safe after his Secret Service detail opened fire on a man who was wielding an assault rifle at a Trump's West Palm Beach, Florida golf course. Joining us now, Jody Schneider. She is a political news director for Bloomberg TV and radio. Joining us on the line from here in New York City. Uh, Jody, the FBI wasted no time in calling this an apparent assassination attempt. It's amazing. I mean, it was only two months ago we were talking about this attempt on uh, former President Trump's life in Butler. Pennsylvania. Does this raise 
many more questions about the Secret Service ability to to protect candidates? Well, it certainly raises a number of questions, um, and we will be hearing about, you know, investigations and looking into these things in coming days and weeks. One of them is how uh, an individual like this was able to get an estimated 300 to 500 yards away from the former president while he was golfing. Um, obviously, the president, the former president is unharmed. There was uh, not the kind of, um, you know, uh, incident that we had in Butler, Pennsylvania in July, uh, where uh, the former president was uh, was injured. And there was, uh, you know, others were injured, others in the crowd, and someone uh, died as well. So it was a different situation. Tonight, actually, the Palm Beach County Sheriff uh, said that the uh, Secret Service uh, agent did a fantastic job, um, given that he basically, um, you know, engaged the man, and they were, uh, the man fled, and then he was subsequently stopped and taken into custody by local police on the highway. So it was a different situation that occurred here, but of course, the question is, why does this keep happening, and how was this individual allowed to get so close? Golf courses are uh, notoriously hard to, um, you know, to defend, given that if they're open spaces, by their very nature, but still, given the uh, increased security that the former president has had uh, in recent uh, months, uh, there's a lot of questions here. Jody, might we expect that security to be uh, to be heightened now going forward for both candidates? Well- Perhaps, but we have seen uh, one of the things that happened after Butler, Pennsylvania, and which you may recall, the Secret Service was, you know, very, uh, you know, criticized, harshly criticized, uh, both in, and by the campaign, but also on Capitol Hill. And the uh, Secret Service director did uh, was really pushed to resign. Um, we the security detail has been enhanced. Um, and as we go through the election and we get closer to the election, there, there, that has been enhanced even more. So there has been more uh, attention paid uh, to the former president's uh, security uh, since then. And uh, in, particularly in, in recent weeks, we've heard even, you know, of even more secure details. So uh, I'm not I don't know how much more they will be adding, but certainly questions of protocol. And again, the very question of how this individual got so close uh, and seemed to know, you know, the, the, about the president's movement, former president's movements at that point. And, this is a concern. And I'm sure we'll be hearing about this uh, on Capitol Hill as well. And no indication at all that it's going to change uh, the campaigning of the former president, correct? Yeah, we have not heard from uh, from the former president uh, this evening. Uh, we've heard from some, uh, you know, close to him that um, he's, you know, there was no immediate comment from uh, former President Trump, but we did hear from Senator Lindsey Graham, who's closely aligned with the former president, said he'd spoken with him and found him in good spirits. Uh, but we have not heard about any changes in uh, in his plans for campaigning. Obviously, yeah. this is a critical time in the campaign, just seven weeks uh, this on Tuesday from election day. Jody, a quick word about this this person, Ryan Ruth, who's been apprehended by authorities. Uh, eight arrests on his record, according to CNN. Do we know much about um, about him and anything about those offenses? No, this this information on him has just come out, and you know, within the hour, uh, you, as you know, CNN's reporting that he has eight arrests on his record, apparently for minor offenses, um, and he was identified as being in custody by federal officials. Uh, that's really all we know at this time. Very interesting uh, that the New York Times pointed out that Mr. Ruth was interviewed by the Times back in 2023 for an article about Americans volunteering to aid the war effort in Ukraine. We'll leave it there. Jody, thank you so much for being with us. Always a pleasure. Jody Schneider, political news director for Bloomberg TV and radio, joining us here on Daybreak Asia. Dana Doria, co-CIO at InvestNet, to take a closer look at markets. And Dana, let's talk a little bit about the Fed this week. Uh, Is it clear now that the inflation fight is kind of yesterday's story? Hi, yes. uh, I would say, actually, I don't I don't think it is clear, unfortunately. Um, You know, we did have an inflation report that I think is gives the the Fed the ability to go either way on the rate cuts, but the core number was a little higher than they would like. And, you know, immediate market response was we're probably not getting the 50. I mean, I think now we're a little bit more, you know, even between the two. 
Um, but no, I, I don't think it's I don't think that we can say that the fight against inflation is really won at this point. And we know historically inflation kind of comes in waves. So right now, Bloomberg data indicate about 100 basis points of cuts um, split across the next three meetings, obviously this week. And then we have November and December, a uh, higher probability of a 50 basis point rate cut at the December meeting, I think, than what we're looking at right now. Is that the way that you are seeing things that the Fed will be gradual, um, but potentially delivering something supersized at, at year's end? So it's interesting that, yeah, I, I see where that um, that narrative comes. But if you think about why we why would we expect that? It, you have to have some expectation of softness to go along with that, right? And it's interesting because bond markets certainly seem to be pricing in that, yeah, you know, things are starting to look a little worse. The soft landing scenario um, maybe, you know, is not going to hold. But equity markets certainly don't seem to be trending that way. I mean, we have seen, obviously, the S&P has had some bad days, uh, you know, over the course of the summer, but it has come back. It's up 18 percent for the year. So I don't think and, and when you look at GDP, you look at um, unemployment at 4.2 percent. Yes, certainly some cooling there, uh, but we're still not in a place that you could call a crisis. And so it's difficult for me to see us getting as many rate cuts at this stage of the game as, as what you're talking about. Right. As what we're seeing in the data. The, re- the reason I asked you that first question in the way I did, I, I can see in your notes uh, how you feel is uh, it kind of um, begs this follow. Then, so would you not cut rates here? Would you would you keep the fight up? No, I think I would cut, but I think it's got to be twenty five. I, I think a fifty would be too big. I don't think the economy is at a place yet. Now, of course, you know there's a whole um, narrative that hey, look, we're already really late on cuts, right? That these things, you know, it all acts with a lag. So so waiting is, you know, problematic because because the upshot is that we're going to have weakness in the economy before there's time for the rate cuts to do anything about it. Yeah, that is one view. Um, but I think net-net, uh, you know, something like a 50 basis point cut is kind of a bazooka right now. So if we can agree that inflation is getting under control and we can also agree, agree that the labor market is softening, one of the things I'm wondering about is whether or not the Fed is trying to take some of the stress out of uh, certain financial conditions right now. You could argue maybe that they're a little easy, but I'm thinking about the degree to which some of the banks may be exposed to higher rates in a way that's really negatively impacting balance sheets still. Well, you know, you are seeing a lot of a lot more breadth than what's succeeding in equity markets right now. And, you know, it's not just tech. Obviously, we know that one of the big stories right now is is it is widening out to areas like banks. And I do think that, you know, um, that's obviously in part because of the expectation that, look, we're we're quibbling over. Is it 50? Is it 25? Is it 100 by year end? But we all know rate cuts are coming. I think that much is is clear. And so I don't you know, it's a question of increments. I think banks are, you know, benefiting and we see small caps benefiting, right? Interest rate parts of the economy that um, interest rate sensitive parts of the economy that have been suffering are, are benefiting. And, you know, that I would expect that to continue forward. So would you be more attracted to the bond market here or to equities? So I would say that it's still a good time to get into bonds. Obviously, um, you know, duration can be good in, in markets like this, I think. Um, you know, it's not too late. Right. And I'm you know, I, there's there's kind of a chorus in the asset allocator space that's come up around, you know, what good is fixed income in general? And, you know, I, I'm very much not in that camp. I think fixed income is an, a very important ballast in most portfolios. I think you still have an opportunity to get in where rates are now. Um, yeah, we, we had a lot of pain when we had to abruptly increase interest rates. But obviously we're we're heading in the opposite direction one way or the other. So I do think bonds are a good place to be. I also think, look, I mean, your view on equity markets, if you think that we're getting rate cuts because it's time, but that we're still sticking the landing, you can really have a lot more breadth in your portfolio and, and even tilt somewhat right to lower priced areas of the market, small cap areas of the market. But if you think we're heading in, into a recession, it doesn't mean leave the market, right? It, taking that chance and, and missing out on the potential in the equity markets is always a fail in most portfolios. But maybe you tilt toward lower volatility stocks, right, or higher quality stocks, defensive so, areas. Dana, when you speak to clients and the subject of the U.S. presidential election comes up, well, the election more broadly, even where uh, Congress is concerned, what are you hearing? What are people saying to you? 
Yeah, it, there's always a ton of questions around what is the impact going to be? And it's really interesting to talk to people about it because it's obviously kind of this really binomial outcome type of event. You know, one side wins and the other side wins. Uh, presidency at any rate, right? Obviously, um, and then Congress to, to your point, but you know, either it, it, either uh, the Senate, it goes one way or the other, right? The House goes one way or the other. So, you know, trying to figure that out and, and invest against it is really difficult, right? The, the price in the market today of any, of any stock, of any security that's tied to the outcome is going to price in some weighted average. If you're wrong, you, you know, you're going to, you're going to lose out from this. So, so what I talked to with clients when they asked me about this is look, number one, there's good evidence that it really doesn't matter much which party is in power. There's all sorts of evidence around whether, you know, the presidency, if it's mixed, et cetera, et cetera, markets still kind of go up. So that's the good news. Um, obviously, in, in, within markets, there's, tie, there's ties to a Democrat or Republican win. So we mentioned earlier that uh, China stumbled uh, uh, a little bit in the last month, uh, and that's been a, a continuing process. Europe is not faring all that well either. Uh, when we look at the global economy and, and the job of the Fed, do we have to factor that in, that those two major areas of business around the world uh, are stumbling and that they could drag the U.S. down? Yeah, well, I mean, for most portfolios, they're going to drag, uh, you know, the investor down in and of themselves, right? Because most portfolios that you see retail advisors are allocating to have a contingent that's international developed or, and even emerging markets. In fact, um, one of the things that I say often from an asset allocation basis is, you know, China is a huge piece of the emerging markets index. Consider having some sort of cap, not market cap weighted on China for exactly the reasons that you're talking about, right? If you if you go back the last several decades, I mean, China is, the, the promise is there, but it hasn't paid off great for U.S. investors. So I think starting point is, you know, you, you have to look at the, the amount that you allocate to international and emerging in general. And I think that's, you know, I'm a proponent of international diversification, um, you know, but the client has to really look at behaviorally, can they tolerate, you know, how much of it can they tolerate? And then secondarily, yes, um, naturally, the you know, we just have seen nothing but correlation increases over time across economies. And so where goes one? Certainly. I mean, you see, for example, uh, with China, you know, um, European luxury goods makers, you know, they get pulled down when China is not doing well. And so, yes, you know, you're going to see it across reverberate across the portfolio. Yeah, I wonder if a question going forward, and we don't have time now, uh, Dana, but just as a way to set up the next time we chat, I wonder if going forward, uh, that correlation breaks down a little bit uh, as countries reshore and sort of focus more on things at home. It, I, it a lot depends whether Donald Trump wins or, or whether Kamala Harris wins uh, in the United States. But Dana, we'll save that one for next time. Thank you so much for joining us. Dana Doria, co-CIO at InvestNet. Eric Lynch, Managing Director at Sharf Investments. So, Eric, I'm just curious whether or not you like the idea of the Fed saying to itself, we won't be late again, uh, referring to its, its slow response to the rapid rise of inflation. Will they not want to be late in addressing the rise in unemployment? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Um, they were certainly late, obviously, during the, the, the run-up. Uh, there's some that would claim that they're already late now. You know, it seems to us that, um, you know, w what's really been an indicator of kind of a future contraction has not been so much the unemployment rate and the so-called SOM rule and our kind of recent obsession uh, of market participants about that, but more looking at the pace of kind of new jobs that have been added. And, you know, that obviously is clearly slowed. We're, we've averaged about 100,000 per month the last three months. Uh, you know, we've had pretty big revisions, even though last week's uh, monthly print was 142,000. The prior two months were revised down back to about 100K. So this tells to us that, okay, companies are concerned about the trajectory. They're slowing things down. At the same time, given what happened in the pandemic, they don't want to cut. So I, I, it does seem like the Fed has given Inflation is coming down, although core, you know, is still kind of quite sticky and problematic. That the balance of risk is now on, um, you know, jobs, and and I think they've certainly got licensed to twenty five, if not if not fifty. 
So what do things look like in Silicon Valley? You're very nearby in Los Gatos. Uh, how is Silicon Valley holding up these days? It's still strong, of course. Uh, obviously, you know, the Mac 7 and a, a lot of the technology that's emanated from here. You know, it's interesting because we're only about, what, a couple months away from the two-year anniversary of the of the, of the date that ChatGPT got, you know, the world's imagination, November 30th. But um, you know, we're, we're here. We certainly still see, you know, healthy optimism. Uh, I will say this, though, you know, being headquartered here, a $5 billion boutique investment firm, great track record, well pedigreed employees. Uh, it's been very difficult to hire college grads for the last decade. You know, we go to conference, uh, you know, we go to uh, job fairs at Berkeley, and we're just kind of lonely folks standing at our, our booth. In the last year, that's changed. We've got 10, 20 kids standing in line, uh, and you know they, they're not finding jobs or interest from the big tech. So certainly, there are cracks even in tech. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I would assert that they have done a student body right from you know general tech kind of spend as well as corporations have done the same an investment, and they they focus so much on AI that's kind of sucking a lot of uh, you know business investment away from other areas. Eric, you do you feel that uh, conditions in the economy have changed a lot to cause that, or do you think it's just companies are maybe not clinging to their employees so much? Uh, you know, there was a a time when they were hoarding employees because they were fearful of not being able to find them. You even referenced that yourself that it wasn't easy there for a long period of time. So, what is it now? Weakening economy, or just maybe changing hiring conditions at the companies? It's, it's probably concern about a weakening economy. You know, we've had a lot of fiscal and monetary stimulus. At one point in the U.S., it was 50% of GDP at the height of the pandemic. That's coming off. I think you have some concerns. I think you have concerns about the ability of corporations to pass on nominal price increases uh, and kind of lever that into, uh, you know, higher profit margins and, and profits. Uh, now that CPI has come down, be careful what you wish for, because now Obviously, that the, the revenue line is is going to moderate for corporate America, certainly, uh, and so there's going to be probably some pushback on margins. Now, margins came through quite strong on Q2 for U.S. corporations. Uh, you know, it's kind of a significant jump from year over year, actually. But I think there is some consternation go forward that you know uh, that could be under pressure. And you've also got kind of the election cycle kind of concerning some. So I think there are some real concerns. You see it in ISM. You see it in the City Surprise Index. You're seeing it in the jobs. There's a lot of clear evidence that the economy is slowing. Not cracking, but it's certainly slowing. Well, there's a lot of capital on the sidelines. I think we can agree on that much. Uh, you mentioned uh, that we're approaching the second anniversary of ChatGPT. We had a story here last week about OpenAI doing a funding round and, and maybe a valuation of around $150 billion. Does that sound excessive to you? It, it does. You know, I, I think one of the things we've done, and, and we have the, the curse and the blessing of being a value equity manager in Silicon Valley, um, it's, you know, you either keep your pricing discipline or you melt uh, because of the pressure. And so, you know, we've done a lot of look around that work around this because it, there's no question this is a powerful technology. There's no question chat GBT is very um, valuable, uh, you know, given the deals it's done with, you know, huge platforms like Apple and, and Alphabet. Of course, it's, 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 you know, Google's worth a lot. Uh, how much is the question, right? And that's what the great question on all the, the 200, 300 billion dollars of, of CapEx and AI the last couple of years. What returns has it generated? So far, very little. Uh, now, going forward, we expect that to happen, but how, how long does it take? And then how you discount that back into you know, present value profits? And, and, and that's why a lot of these names are down. You know, quarter to date Q3, IT yeah. sector is down heading into this past week, 8%. Max 7's been down. It's been the rest of the 493 that have been raising things. So there, yeah. there's some concern. So that. That breadth uh, feels pretty good to some people. Um, the figures that I mentioned were, as you mentioned, the uh, MAG-7 index down 5 to 8%. Uh, real estate utilities gaining 11%. But just here of late, you know, we have seen uh, mega cap do pretty well. Uh, you know, do, you, do you like the 493 at the moment or do you like the 7? Re really like, honestly, the 493. Just because here's why. The major question, the major point to make here on this topic, it's a great question, is, 
to date, the Max 7 in particular were responsible for f- over 100% of S&P 500 earnings for the last six quarters until Q2. They were responsible for less than half. And so IT you know, was still the leader up about 20% year over year and uh, EPS. But things like financials and healthcare were up 18 and 17% uh, respectively. More interestingly, as consensus has that trend continuing. So that growth scarcity problem seems to be abating. And so what's happened is next year, things like the even Russell 1000 value uh, ex- consensus earnings growth is expected to be 15% uh, percent year over year. Max 7 is down to 16. Max 7 trading above 30. Russell 1000 value is trading at 15. So it's all about just relative risk versus reward. And and I think that, you know, if we don't have a, a hard landing and you don't have growth scarcity, the other 493 are very attractive. We've got stocks in our portfolio that are up a lot after Q2 season. And, you know, all they did was grow 10, 12, 15% earnings, but because they've been neglected for years, they've been catching a bit. Eric, very quickly, uh, 30 seconds or so, it was about 18 months ago that Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. How, how is commercial real estate holding up in, in the Bay Area? It's still it's still struggling. You know, vacancy rates are still quite high. You know, the return to the office is slowest in the Bay Area as a function of the tech kind of uh, industry dominating here and the ability to work remotely. So it's still struggling. Uh, it's going to take a while. And just briefly in 10 seconds, drill, baby, drill. Does that mean lower prices and lower profits or better conditions for the oil companies? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, lack of supply has really helped companies amp up their capex and and finally you know generate real good capital returns for investors until until oils kind of hit them so yeah it's yeah. It's, it's it's tough to say i, I think it's kind of like current- uh, be careful what you wish for i think in some ways for the for the oil industry anyway eric out of time thank you eric lynch from sharf investments this has been the bloomberg daybreak asia podcast bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the asia pacific visit the bloomberg podcast channel on youtube to get more episodes of this and other shows from bloomberg subscribe to the podcast on apple spotify or anywhere else you listen and always on bloomberg radio the bloomberg terminal and the bloomberg business app 